So Dan, if you give me a thumbs up. Hey, good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society April event. Uh, you've stumbled in on us if you're on our YouTube channel right now. And I have our members assembling in the background here on a Zoom feed. I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, my name is uh, Ted Williams, and I'm the um, Rittenhouse Astronomical Society president. And uh, tonight we have really kind of a special lineup for everybody. Uh, and before we get started, I thought I'd introduce you a little bit. I'm going to see if I can uh, share a screen. Of course, I've lost that button now right at that moment that I need it more. Okay. How about let's try it. No, let's do this one. I came back. Uh, give me a second, folks. Everybody, we're live. Well, anyhow, um, I'd like to welcome you all. We have a couple groups of students that are in the house with us also. We have Arcadia University here tonight. I'd like to thank those students for coming out and possibly attending with us in the background. We also might have some people from Millersville University. Um, Arcadia University is just outside of Glenside, Pennsylvania. And uh, Miller's University, Millersville University is just south of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, I'd like to welcome you all. And I found my button so I can do this now. Um, you should be seeing our website pop up in front of you in just a moment. And I believe it's right there now for you. And uh, tonight we have an amazing event, a return guest speaker who I'll address in just a minute. But just like our television shows, I want to give you a heads up of what's coming up in the future real quick. All I can say is, what a great amount of news that I can bring you to say. We get to get together live finally. We get to have a gathering where we bring our telescopes out. We get to get together and it's going to happen at Ryan Observatory. It's going to be on Saturday, April 23rd, and we're running an open house. And to start that all off, we're even going to have a live AstroQuora from the observatory. And that's going to be this Tuesday night. And then I'll talk about these later in the presentation. We also have an amazing lineup coming up this spring. Uh, thanks to uh, Lydell, we have Warren Keller. Just look up Billions and Billions, his website. Uh, those of you who are into astrophotography might know a little bit about his new book, uh, Updating Inside Pixin Site. We have another open house that we're going to try to get you involved with. And we also have a June event, uh, astrophotographer extraordinaire, Ron Breacher. Check out his website at astro.com. So we'll talk a little bit more about them later in the evening. That's all the stuff that's actually coming up. Uh, we are the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. And um, although we are a nonprofit organization, uh, we run as a not-for-profit. That means there's nobody collecting a salary. There's nobody making any money off of Rittenhouse. Um, we survive by the generous, the generosity of our membership and also those people who attend our events. If you take a look at our website, we are a business and we still have to pay bills. We have insurance. We have web fees. You can donate to Rittenhouse. The button is an upright home corner. You can do a one-time donation there uh, for $35. You can become a member and you get in onto our AstroCora forums. You get into our uh, live Zoom uh, interaction also. So that's kind of neat. And and uh, when I say I'm really excited about working with uh, Ryan Observatory, oh, not that one. Let's try. Here we are. This is an amazing facility. And those of you who are our new members who have just signed on and those of you who are our students, please feel free to come on out uh, for this open house. We're going to do this rain or shine. And that's because not only do we have the observatories here, um, we have an outdoor amphitheater. But if you look on the right there where that visitor center is, we also have an indoor area where we can seat about 125 people. We're going to run this rain or shine on that night because we do have people who bring families out that evening. So even if it's raining, come on in the visitor center. We'll be opening up the uh, universe hallway. We also have breakout sessions and conference rooms in there that we do some activities with. And we'll still take you out into the observatory. It's kind of interesting when you're in there in the rain, but rain or shine, it actually makes for a really nice night. So come on out, everybody. This is the first time in almost two years that we're going to have live events again. But we all have some very fond memories here. The pictures at the very end were the biggest uh, festival that we held there, which was the Star Sky and Star Fest. So a lot of our members have enjoyed many years already 
33 years of, uh, of Ryan Observatory. And when you arrive, you'll see another building, another structure there, which is a neat future project that we're working on. We'll talk a little bit about that too. Okay, so I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll come back to you right now. Again, I'd like to welcome you if you're just joining in, Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. I'm Ted Williams, and we have a very special guest speaker tonight. A uh, gentleman has been with us on multiple occasions. And um, if I said he was a uniquely compelling, engaging college professor that might have inspired a couple of the board members who are right here at Rittenhouse to get involved and pick up the torch, um, he might be that character. But more recently, in our preamble, you met Mike Mountjoy. Mike Mountjoy has been a longtime uh, member at Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. He also supports our board. He's a board member, too, which means extra meetings, extra decisions, extra papers. But anyhow, it's great that Mike's been in the background with us for so many years. He's 15 plus years also with the organization. And when we last saw Mike at the Franklin Institute, he had uh, gained some colleagues and friends at the Muter Museum and moved into their sphere. And he knows Robert from maybe a different angle. So I'll turn it over to Mike. And Mike, would you introduce Robert to our uh, public who might not have ever met him before? You know, Ted, I'd be happy to do that. It's kind of an honor. Um, I've, I've met Robert through several, several different directions now. Um, I actually met him first at the Rittenhouse, and then I met him a second time uh, through what is now my sister-in-law. And... Um, at the Mütter Museum, and I've I've had uh, my my family meet him. He gave us kind of a behind the scenes tour of the of the, of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. Um, his role at the College of Physicians, of course, has changed over the years. Um, he has most recently taken a role as the he was the director of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia and the Mütter Research Institute. Uh, he is now the senior consulting scholar for the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. They are the all, oldest college of physicians uh, in America, as far as I'm aware. Dr. Hicks, you can always uh, correct me if I'm in, if I'm wrong there. Uh, he's been working on a number of things, and um, one of which is a book, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but like uh, Ted said, several members of our board uh, originally met Robert when he did a course for the University of the Arts, and it was a course done for teachers. And it was about astronomy and the purpose of the course was to give teachers better tools so that they would be able to better engage their students. So they met at a number of different uh, astronomically significant locations around the city and including the Franklin Institute, the Battleship New Jersey. Um, I believe you guys were at the um, Philosophical Society of, of, of Philadelphia. Seaport uh, Museum. Course. Yes and the, the Seaport Museum, and, and that was a course about celestial navigation. So I believe that's where Ruth and Fern and Ted all first connected, and that's why they're basically all board members. Um, so they did some amazing work with that course, uh, and that's again, 2008. So the, obviously the impact of this course has been uh, long running, Robert. So in case you were unaware of how much of effect you've had on some of these people, um, that's how it's gone down. Uh, He's also currently writing a book, as I understand it, uh, and it's a study of seven veterans of the Civil War and how the injuries and uh, experiences they had during the Revolutionary War affected them. Uh, and it's a study through the College of Physicians of, of how these people were changed um, by war and by their experiences there. Um, but I don't believe that book is out yet, correct? No. Okay, so that's that's the ongoing project. Um, he's uh, his most recent project has been uh, the talk he's going to give to us tonight. Uh, it's called No Limit on Space, and it is a talk about the popular astronomy in 19th century Philadelphia. Because apparently, none of us knew 19th century Philadelphia was like the hotbed of people in the general public being interested in astronomy. Um, including some of the resources that were provided to the public through like the library system and things like that. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. But Robert, I'm going to give you a challenge. And that is at some point during your talk, you're going to have to explain to us, since uh, I don't know if any of you know, uh, Robert worked at the U.S. Naval Observatory during his um, graduate work. Um, you have to tell us how a man got stuck in the tube of a telescope 
at the U.S. Naval Observatory in this country while you were there. And I, I got to know this. So during your talk, you don't have to brush that part, but I've got to know how did a man get stuck in the tube of a telescope at the U.S. Naval Observatory? I'm just curious. So ladies and gentlemen, if I may introduce Dr. Robert Hicks, and he hates that. So let's just say, Robert, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much. I will reveal that story in due course about how a man got stuck in a telescope and uh, caused some embarrassment all around. Um, but thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Ted, for that as well. Um, in your part of the introduction, Ted, you referred to me as a college professor, which I've only done part-time occasionally, but the word probably is that, that you use that best applies is character. Not that I have it, it's that I am one. So, uh, and now for something completely different. So, seeing me, and we'll come back to my face later, should we go to my PowerPoint? And we'll do a share screen here. Coming up. Hey, are we there? Yes, we're there. Okay, great. Looking good. All right. Uh, no Limit to Space is a quotation from a 19th century popular astronomy book. And if there's one theme about astronomy and Americans in the 19th century, it's an increasingly awareness through that century how big the universe is and it keeps getting bigger. But I had to show you this illustration. It's one of my favorites. It's from a popular astronomy magazine. And if you want to play history detective with this illustration, uh, I'm going to point you to a couple of unusual characteristics. Certainly, there's the sun at the middle, and you can see the planets and so on. Uh, it's sort of a surreal illustration with those uh, uh, little boys all lined up at attention in military fashion with their instructors pointing with their sticks, which probably double as disciplinary tools. And that poor little kid in the center is grinding away at this big orrery showing the movements of the planets and the sun and so on. And one uh, instructor on the left is pointing to the sky where you have these orbits shown. And the little history detective moment is this. I'm bringing a laser pointer into this. And just above this are three little planets called Ceres, Pallas, Juno, and Vesta. Mm -hmm. and one of the biggest discoveries in astronomy at the beginning of the 19th century was asteroids. And these in particular, four brightest ones. And as the century went on, dozens and dozens more were found. But what's intriguing here is this planet we call Uranus. And on this illustration, it's called Herschel. And for Neptune, we have not Neptune, but the Verrier. So take note of that. <coughs> later, and this will equip you to date almost exactly when this illustration was printed. Now, as far as my credentials to talk about all of this tonight, uh, I have been very fortunate in having access since my teenage years to 19th century telescopes and was living in South America in the 1960s. That's me at this telescope. It's a Mertz and Mahler refracting telescope. It was imported from Germany in order to establish an observatory in Quito, Ecuador. Now, if you are astronomically minded and you look at this telescope here, it's on a particular mount that's called an equatorial mount. And you have an axis here with weights and a circle on the end. And then there's a circle right behind the telescope here, which is anchoring an axis going this way. Now, the axis here is perpendicular to the pillar. So the magic question is, where is this telescope? Uh, you should be able to infer the latitude of it from the orientation of the mount, because for those of you that have telescopes with this kind of a mounting, this is called the declination axis and points to the North Star. So if this is perpendicular to the pillar, where's the North Star? It's right on the horizon. So think about it. Uh, this is the observatory that houses this telescope right here. This was built in the 1870s. And I was very fortunate not only to have this shirt, which was green with white polka dots, but to have access to this. And I have to tell you that when I wore this shirt, this was the height of fashion, carnival <laughs> in, in the 1960s. And don't you forget it. Uh, I was lucky enough to get the keys to this observatory in order to make free use of this telescope. And for a teenage kid, 
uh, that was a big responsibility. And I can tell you, uh, over, half, over a half a century later, I still have the keys to that place. I never gave them back. Now, once upon a time, 2,000 years ago, this was a model of the universe. And uh, these two models are essentially the same, even though they were made uh, two centuries apart. Earth at the center, uh, the circles represent the apparent motions of the sun, moon, planets. And the other circles are reference circles for measuring. Now, this is both a model that could be used in a classroom as well as a computational device because by manipulating these rings, you can figure out stuff like the time of sunset and sunrise at your particular location. So that's 2000 years ago. Where do we go from there? Uh, in the Middle Ages, the university curriculum had four subjects uh, known as the quadrivium. And one of those subjects was astronomy. And here you have a scholar playing with one of those armillary spheres and an illustration from a book from about 600 years ago, 700 years ago, uh, with the major circles identified that you saw on that model. Now, you may be thinking, this is all very pretty, but what happens if you take this sphere and squish it flat? What do you get? You get this. This is called an astrolabe, and uh, you're looking at a very beautiful one, and squished onto that surface are some movable parts. And those movable parts indicate uh, bright stars against a background template that allows you to measure and place stars according to a configuration for any day, any time of the year. And there are no batteries in this to replace at all. It has a flip side that allows you to use this to actually make some sightings of the altitudes of celestial objects and do computations. This is a removable plate from the other side where the north, north point of the sky, the celestial north pole would be right where the red dot is. This would be your horizon line. So all these lines on this grid here show lines of altitude above the horizon, uh, which is what you're measuring with this, how far something is over the horizon. You can make many computations with this, very sophisticated instrument, but it's a squished armillary sphere. This is an armillary sphere squished into an astrolabe now called a planisphere made of cardboard. Now, I mentioned the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion because this uh, beautiful little planisphere printed on cardboard in the 1800s is in that house. If you have not been to this museum, I suggest you go. It's the only Victorian house museum in Philadelphia. It is, uh, uh, was built for a middle-class family with middle-class interests, one of which would have been astronomy, which was a very, very popular subject in the 19th century. Now, the planisphere this, that we have available to us come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Here are three that you can buy today. Uh, these planispheres are really stripped down versions, even in the, the one I showed you in cardboard, uh, because these allow you to show what's in the sky, visible from your location at any hour of the day, any day of the year. Well, the one I just showed you allows you to perform additional computations. These are kind of stripped down and simplified, but they're easily available and are sold probably everywhere. There's a science center or a science museum. Let's take a step back and talk about the 19th century world with respect to astronomy in the United States and Philadelphia in particular. Uh, the upper right-hand corner is the American Philosophical Society. Uh, which formed as a learned society to advance knowledge. And in the early 1800s in the young United States, uh, there were about 30 such uh, lyceums, as they were mostly called, where people gathered to talk about what's new, what's being discovered, what's being invented. Let's expand knowledge. This is a thing people did at the end of a long working day. One of the big moves made in the young United States was to establish the United States Naval Observatory in Washington. And here you see a 19th century illustration. And a dome, of course. Also, this building here had a specialized telescope that's a slit in the roof because that telescope only moves in a north-south direction. It's called the transit circle, and it's used for measuring positions of stars. So that was one of the major functions. Why was an observatory established in the United States? Well, one of the reasons was Europe's got plenty of these things. If we're going to represent ourselves as a young nation, 
capable of doing scientific things? Well, we need an observatory. Also, uh, we need to have a sort of a national center for developing timekeeping standards and timekeeping measurements. And with the expansion of the railroads across the United States, you had to have time zones. You had to have a reference point for time. Well, the Naval Observatory played a role in that because, of course, time relates to what's going on in the sky. Now, the U.S. Naval Observatory uh, in the 1800s acquired one big telescope. Before about 1850, any telescopes in observatories in America were purchased abroad. And the Mertz and Mahler firm that gave, you that gave me that telescope in Ecuador also provided telescopes for several observatories. About 1850, there were about 15 observatories in the United States. And over the next 30 years, that jumped up to about 150, 160. Well, here you have in the upper right, uh, a print of the main telescope in the United States Naval Observatory, which is a 26 inch refracting telescope. So there is a lens here, and this is the tube. And I could not resist putting me in the picture. That's not me at the 26 inch, although I used to give tours of that instrument. But in another dome, they had a 12 inch that looked like a miniature of this one. And I was allowed free use of that while I worked summers as a college student at the Naval Observatory. And uh, a comparable instrument, which would have been one of the largest, not only in the United States, but in the world, was the Great Equatorial, as it was called, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's part of Harvard Observatory. And I'm sorry, I couldn't resist including a picture of me down right below at the controls of this telescope. No, I did not have, not have free use of this. I'm just posing for a picture. But hey, I like to visit 19th century telescopes. Now, one main use uh, for the Naval Observatory, main purpose, and the Naval Observatory is still a functioning observatory today, uh, is navigation, marine navigation. It was necessary to have up-to-date astronomical data, not just on the apparent movement of the sun throughout the year, but also significant bright stars, the planets, and these instruments, which evolved from the 18th to the 19th century were found on every ship in ocean going navigation, a sextant or its previous incarnation octant. And actually Philadelphia plays a big role in that. Uh, at the end of the 18th century, well, and I shouldn't say the end, it was more like the other end of the 18th century. This instrument was actually invented simultaneously in the United States and in England. The guy in the United States who came up with the same configuration uh, was a man named Godfrey. And he is buried at Laurel Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia. And if you hunt around and look for his obelisk over his grave, you will find a sextant on it. Philadelphia plays a big role in the history of astronomy in 19th century United States. Now, in my presentation, I'm going to visit uh, a couple of people that are worth knowing, who are popularizers, educators in astronomy, very popular lecturers particularly. And I'm also going to be uh, pulling from some of the very commonly read uh, books on astronomy at the time for general audiences. And that includes school audiences. I have a small collection of these and some of them have uh, ownership signatures which allow us to find out who was reading these and why. The telescopes that are most commonly discussed in any of this in the 19th century are either refractors with or reflectors. And uh, just in case some of you uh, are too embarrassed to admit you don't own a telescope, well, here's where you can start. Refracting telescope is here, lens here, transmitting light to this end, other lenses that give you the image. And various magnifications are possible. The reflecting telescope here involves light coming down the tube, bouncing off a mirror that's uh, uh, got a concavity to it that focuses the light up here and out an eyepiece. So you're looking at a reflection and then lenses that bring you the image. Now, both of these were available. The Probably the most popular uh, uh, kind of telescope in American observatories and also for private ownership were refracting telescopes. And they weren't cheap. Uh, there wasn't a big tradition of amateur telescope making at this time because it would have been hard to get the materials to do it. Now, I'd like to start with this book as illustrative of where we were in the first half of the 19th century. 
Uh, this uh, uh, intelligent looking man is named Thomas Dick. He was a minister in Scotland, in Edinburgh, and he uh, ran into the misfortune of having a baby by his maidservant. And when his wife found out, she left him and he was excommunicated. And he reinvented himself as a philosopher and as a popularizer of astronomy. Now, here's the title page from this work, Celestial Scenery, an example of one of the woodcuts. And he's highlighting the asteroids, which would have been fairly recent discoveries of this time. Now, Dick's uh, book was very popular in the United States. It went through American editions and British editions. And uh, this, uh, not surprisingly, has a um, a religious feel to it. It's not unusual for books written by ministers on astronomy to include some moral messages in there and also some reference to biblical verses. Even astronomers who are not uh, divines or, or, or ministers or preachers would also do that from time to time uh, because it was hard for anyone to talk about astronomy without talking about a religious impulse. That is, you're going to talk about the creator and his creations, so, you know, credit where credit's due. Now, Dick, uh, Dick's work, although he's technically an amateur, it's worth remembering there really is no distinction between amateurs and professionals at this time. There are very few people that would have a title professor of astronomy, and it's not as if they went through some astronomy curriculum to get there. Uh, a lot of these people who uh, wrote these books were essentially um, self-study, and Thomas Dick is no uh, different. Now, this book is very readable. It's very good. Uh, he's got a great style. He's a bit funny, and he takes an unusual point of view when he talks, for example, about the moon and the other planets. He wants to talk about how it would look if we were on those planets looking outward and looking at the distant Earth. That's an unusual perspective, and that is stretching a lot of imaginations at this time. On the importance of astronomy in this book, he says, and I quote, astronomy is calculated to convey a lesson of humility and of humanity to those proud and ambitious mortals who glory in their riches and who fancy themselves to be a species of demigods. Now, this book happens to coincide with an important historical moment in the United States, which contributes to its popularity. And then you see on the right, another illustration from the book. Uh, these are woodblock illustrations. And this one you can see uh, shows the inferior planets, Mercury and Venus, and their phases as seen from Earth. Uh, and the Dix book, like almost every astronomy book of the 19th century, whether it's for uh, a more sophisticated student or for the general public, tends to echo the curriculum of the medieval period. It starts with the basics, the celestial sphere, what was represented by that armillary sphere. How do you orient yourself to the sky? And there's one important piece that appears in that book and appears in every astronomy book after that. And that's how to gauge your perception of astronomical phenomena. What I mean is, we all know from common sense that a sun rises, goes up in the sky and sets at the end of the day. So the caution here is that any student of astronomy needs to be aware of the difference between the apparent and the real. What we see the sun doing is an apparent movement, but the real movement is that the sun isn't moving, the earth is. So readers are constantly reminded that they have to be mindful of their common sense, preconceptions about how things work when they're investing their time in this subject. Now, the Second Great Awakening was a national evangelic movement. People were uh, going to big mega camp cities to hear preachers, to be saved, to get saved again, to sing psalms, to enjoy Christian fellowship. And you see an illustration of this here. This went on all over the country, and it, it uh, really... Uh, echoed a, a, an immense evangelical fervor, not only about people in their individual lives, but their expectations for the new nation of the United States. And everybody was conscious that they are surging ahead in a new nation doing new things. Well, Dick's book hit a very big chord with this movement because it's written by, well, a former, former minister of the gospel. And the astronomy in this book 
is tempered by philosophical musings about Christianity. Now, we have to remember, as all of you with telescopes uh, are painfully aware, that uh, our urban skies don't show you a lot of stars at night, and you have to travel, travel a distance. This was not true in 19th century America, and it's worth remembering that astronomy touched everyday lives in ways that they, it doesn't now. When we see images of uh, Hubble telescope and we uh, see documentaries about hadron colliders and uh, hadron uh, colliders and, and looking at uh, uh, evidence of the birth of the universe, this is pretty abstract stuff to most people who have an interest in science but are not technically adept. This was not really the case in the 19th century. People could go out and look at stars. You could be in Philadelphia and go out and see the Milky Way in the middle of the street. Uh, this is a good example of something that's become now popular myth about enslaved people escaping to the north, in part navigating through astronomy by recognizing the Big Dipper or the drinking gourd and being able to uh, navigate to north. And as you see in the diagram down below, these stars in the Big Dipper uh, point to a relatively a faint star relative to the stars in the Big Dipper. It's actually the North Star. So the sky overnight appears to pivot around this point, a good guidepost to north. Now, the historical evidence is actually rather shaky for this following the drinking gourd uh, idea, but I don't think that's important because people were very sensitive to the sky, and even people who were enslaved and were prohibited from reading and writing still could see a sky and still could watch its movements and still could learn from what they have observed. There would have been a lot of common knowledge uh, among enslaved people just as there was among educated white people about how the sky appears to work and could be made useful. And here we see one of uh, our foremost African-Americans in astronomy from a very early time in the country's history, Benjamin Banneker, who produced the almanac you see in the middle. Now, almanacs from this era are pretty easy to find on eBay um, for a good reason. Any household that had any books at all in the 19th century had a Bible and had an almanac. And what do you need for an almanac? Astronomy. People used almanacs for all kinds of advice for agricultural purposes. Uh, and this is where you would go to find out when the sun's going to rise, when the sun's going to set, what about the moon, what about the phases of the moon, uh, what predictions can be made about the weather. And that brings us to this man, Elijah Burritt, a Connecticut man. Uh, like other people who I will talk about, self-made in many respects, tried a variety of trades. Uh, he was fascinated by astronomy. He worked for a while as a school teacher, but his mainstay was working as a blacksmith. And he studied astronomy in his off hours, how few of those there must have been. He became quite expert at it, and he was inspired by Thomas Dick. Thomas Dick said, what we need is a good general handbook of astronomy, one that not only teaches the basics, but is forward thinking, uh, gives a good history, also shows us what people were doing in astronomical research. Uh, where are the telescopes? Where are the observatories? Well, Buret set out to do just that. Now, my copy of this uh, that you see the front page of here from an 1866 edition is the first rare book I ever bought. And it cost me a buck, and I bought it from a used bookstore in Upper State New York in the 1960s. Well, it has an ownership signature down below, very hard to read. Uh, it's in pencil. And I've always been intrigued by what that meant and where it came from. And I just recently found out. It's the Friends Academy in Springport, New York. And you see it in the image up here, Union Springs, same location. This is an offshoot of the first coeducational school in the United States, which was Quaker run and organized, as is this one. Uh, this was a Quaker school. Quakers uh, had very firm ideas about educating both boys and girls, and astronomy was one of the uh, much taught subjects, not only in Quaker schools, but in the other school. So my copy was once part of this. Uh, I bought this in a store on the south side of Lake Cayuga, this place was on the north side of Lake Cayuga, so for over a century it was kicking around. Now, this was a two-part book. Uh, it not only was set up as a book that would serve self-study, but also for classroom use, uh, but it was accompanied by an atlas, Geography of the Heavens, with these very, very appealing, colorful illustrations 
showing uh, mythological figures against the sky. Here you see the constellation of Orion uh, about to uh, club uh, Taurus the bull into insensibility while the, the peacock uh, in the southern skies happens to watch the whole thing. Um, nowadays, it's very hard to find both the handbook and the atlas together. They separated long ago, and these atlases, usually as torn out pages, are so, uh, sold for very high prices because they're very collectible. Now, uh, this was perhaps the most uh, purchased and used astronomy book from about the 1840s going forward, uh, and it was in print almost to the end of the century. Uh, so this was a mainstay of popular astronomy education. Uh, Elijah Burritt um, didn't really benefit from this too much over time because uh, he moved to take up a new profession when Texas became an independent country before it was a state. And he and his family went down to Texas to make a go of it, and he caught yellow fever and died at a young age. Now, if you have a planisphere handy, you can take this old book and actually make it work for you because it gives you uh, examples of problems you could work out by looking at pages in the atlas. Well, instead of an atlas, use a planisphere. This is a, a picture of the planisphere that I have at home. And here's a good example of a problem you could work out on one. What stars will be on the meridian at nine o'clock on the 19th of January? Well, the meridian is the imaginary line going north-south and every star moving over the course of the, the night sky is going to pass that meridian. So on the planisphere, you can see there's a north here, north-south line. So we can adjust this to the date and time, and I can see what stars actually line up on that meridian. And on my planisphere, I get two really bright stars, which are Rigel and Capella. So let's see what the 19th century book tells us. Well, look at that, the solution. Principal stars standing over that 19th January are Rigel and Capella. It works. Uh, here you have a couple of pages showing you uh, some of the abundant illustrations from the Elijah Burritt book. And although refractors and reflectors were the most common telescopes for people to use, they were not the only kinds. And uh, some of you might be surprised to see, even in the 1860s, they're talking about these. Cassegrain reflector, for example. Um, a Herschelian reflector, which is illustrated down below. And these variants can still be found today. This illustration here was uh, the large telescope known as the 40-foot the telescope that was set up by the 18th century astronomer uh, William Herschel, who discovered the planet uh, Uranus. And by the way, it's not Uranus, it's Uranus. <clears throat> so here we are back at that planisphere. The one that Ebenezer Maxwell has is by this guy, Henry Whitehall, who uh, is another self-made man who saw an opportunity and thought astronomy education is a thing. And he started producing these planispheres. They go through many different variants over time. The one here that Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion has uh, dates from the 1870s. This strut here saves you that problem of finding that meridian. This represents the meridian itself. Uh, the stars are located here. There's some pretty dense text on one side, a lot of problems like in Burit saying, here's how to do blah, 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 and here's some examples, try them out. What do you do to find blah, blah, blah? Uh, again, this is the same armillary sphere orientation. Remember the extension of the north pole of Earth is a celestial north pole where there is a star Polaris, a south celestial pole, there is a celestial equator, and then the red is the path, the apparent path of sun, moon, and stars against a, uh, planets, against a background of stars. So all of this is in your mind as you use the planisphere. And this planisphere was actually sold with a handbook, which gave you a lot more astronomical information. Uh, these were very popular because if a school wanted to have a globe, and what school doesn't want a globe in the classroom? Globes were normally sold in sets, a terrestrial globe and a celestial globe, and they were expensive. So if you could get your hands on at least an Earth globe uh, and wanted an astronomy one, the cheapest way to do it is to get a planisphere. Now, children's literature is not to be overlooked here either. And uh, among the popular children's books were the Peter Parley series. Peter Parley is sort of a, an imaginary guide in these books. 
The one you see on the right, uh, the sun, moon, and stars, is designed for very, very young children, uh, primary school grades. Uh, the picture of the balloon on the left doesn't seem to have anything to do with anything, but um, my copy, notice it was printed in Philadelphia. A lot of the books that I'll be showing you printed in Philadelphia. Mine was a Christmas present to a William Carroll Bush by his Aunt Helen on Christmas 1859. The one on the left, uh, Illustrations of Astronomy, uh, carries actually some of the same illustrations as found in, in the uh, book on the right, but it's designed for older kids. I'd say middle school. And I, as a side note here, the language used in these books, even the intended for children or those intended for adults who are not specialists but want to learn about astronomy, are at a higher pitch of sophistication than popular astronomy books are today. Sorry about that. Uh, it's just um, the expectations were higher that people that are going to read popular works are going to get more science and they're going to get more math. And these books are not particularly timid about showing some geometry and trigonometry. Now, the one for the uh, little kids has illustrations like over on the left, there's old Peter Parley showing the moon to some kids and an example of an illustration below where you have uh, a ball on a stick that's moved around a, a candle in order to illustrate how sun illuminates the earth over the course of the year. But of course, these books all have to have morals. And bear with me as I read you this one in case you can't see it on your screen. At the conclusion of this book, Peter Parley says, it would give me great pleasure to know that my little readers have been all of them pleased with these stories. To an old man that is now gray and lame, it would be a matter of delight as he hobbles about the streets to see in the bright faces of the little boys and girls a smiling, thank you, Mr. Parley. Thank you for your stories. But to tell you the truth, I have a deeper wish than this. I have sought to give you pleasure, but I am more anxious that you should be wise and good. I have not forgotten that you have a life to live here and hereafter. And I hope you will never forget that happiness is the lot of the virtuous and misery the certain doom of the wicked. You don't see that in astronomy books too often anymore. Now, I wanted to introduce you to some people and you've met uh, Thomas Dick, Elijah Aburit. It's time for a woman and an important one. Mariah Mitchell. And apparently it wasn't Maria, but Mariah Mitchell. Now, uh, Mariah Mitchell grew up uh, in a Quaker household. Her father uh, did some uh, construction, uh, make models. Uh, he actually built an observatory and was an amateur astronomer himself. Although again, the distinction between amateur and professional didn't really mean a lot at the time. Well, this is where young Mariah spent her nights. And as a young woman, she discovered a comet. And this made her instantly world famous. And she did it with a two inch refracting telescope. That is the lens two inches. And this telescope doesn't have any GPS control. It doesn't have a little finder to help you narrow in. And yet her familiarity with the sky was such that she could see that fuzzy little object through the telescope, watch it from night to night and realize what she had. Uh, this got her international acclaim, and it got her a lot of honors, too. She becomes the first woman astronomer in the United States. She becomes the first American scientist to discover a comet, and she becomes the first woman professor of astronomy. And this is somebody you really want to take to lunch or dinner. She sounds not only fascinating, but fun. Now, here she is later on, uh, mm -hmm. Vassar College is founded and she is invited to take on the role of professor of astronomy. And this is her big toy, as you see right here on the left with one of her students. And I just love these pictures. You're so used to seeing 19th century women in static portraits in uh, these long dresses in domestic settings. And it is just cool as anything to see them running telescopes and doing astronomy, doing science. Uh, so Mitchell uh, actually did not get a formal education past the age of 16, but she was a fast learner, self learner, like some of these other people. And she opened a school for educating girls in math and science and became a librarian at the Nantucket Athenaeum. A, a subscription library uh, set up by local citizens. And that's what propels her forward into astronomy. 
She also has a claim to being the very first woman to be employed by the federal government because she was hired to help work on the U.S. Coastal Survey, a constant work, Naval Observatory again, of uh, creating and modifying maps of coastlines, hazards to shipping, and all of that. Here she is with her students. Um, she, uh, by all accounts, was an extremely engaging professor. And uh, since it was not seemly for women to go out at night, uh, what do you do if astronomy requires it? Well, the women were in a dormitory and Mariah would simply go in there, ring the bell, wake everybody up and said, okay, up and at them, get up to the observatory, we got work to do. And so established that and um, the decorum issue sort of dissolved away very quickly. Uh, not only was she a good educator, uh, which was her primary job here, she is contributing to science along with her students. They do publish papers and they do get money to go on eclipse expeditions. As you see in the image at left, I think this was in Iowa um, where there was a, a total eclipse of the sun. So there they are with their telescopes ready to go. Uh, the image at upper right shows Mariah Mitchell's very first class of women at uh, her teaching. And the instrument in the foreground that looks a little strange is probably a transit circle, one of those telescopes that only moves in one direction, north to south. And the image at lower right shows Mariah Mitchell's classroom. Now, Mitchell uh, liked to do things beyond just the astronomy in the dome. She held dome parties for her students and also invited in speakers. Now, being a Quaker school, being a Quaker herself, uh, she brought in, for example, abolitionists at the time of the Civil War. Julia Ward Howe, who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic, was an invited speaker in the observatory one night. Uh, in these dome parties, uh, the women would write little poems and limericks to one another. And then if they were to be sung, they would be sung and they'd have a good time. They'd have refreshments, cut a piece of cake and then called it a night. Uh, one of these uh, little missives dashed off by one of the students was addressed to Mariah, the teacher, and it was to be sung to uh, the tune of Old Lang Syne, and it had this phrase in it, while Saturn's ring is poised aright and Saturn's moon still glow, the five who watch them many a night will not from memory go. Years later, uh, some of these students became pioneering women in science. Probably many of them are also political activists as well, and one of them wrote Mariah Mitchell uh, a letter about a year before she died. And it said this, in all the great wonder of life, you have given me more of what I have wanted than any other creature ever gave me. I hoped I should amount to something for your sake. Now, moving on to the 1870s through 1890s, other things are beginning to happen in astronomy. And here's a good example, this particular book also printed in Philadelphia, uh, which dates from the 1870s, is specifically designed, de de uh, designed for the upper grades of high school. And it's oriented essentially as both a teacher's guide and a student guide. Questions. And I wanted to highlight two things here. Uh, my particular copy was actually owned by a woman, Edna Varney of Scohegan in Maine, College of 90. I don't know exactly what school it was. But notice the question, are the planets inhabited? This is a question of great popular interest, it says. And I should say from the very beginning of these popular astronomy books and lectures throughout the 1800s, the number one question people ask is, are there other beings out there on other worlds? And the answer uh, evolves over the course of the century. First of all, it's assumed that God didn't just place people on one planet in what seems to be a very vast universe, but rather there must be people out there. They could be, even be people in the moon. Maybe they live inside the moon. And of course, Jules Verne uh, uh, parodied that in, in From the Earth to the Moon. Uh, but this is a very common belief. People took it as axiomatic. But as the century went on, astronomy books became more cautious with this question saying, well, we're always asked this. We have to address this but we have no scientific way of demonstrating whether it's true or not, because if they're out there, they're so remote, we're never gonna be able to see them through a telescope anyway, so why talk about it? Let's just say, yeah, somebody's out there and that's that. And no one, of course, ever imagined that there could be even a face-to-face -face meeting between a being from another world 
and a being from our own. But it's interesting that the expectation was, yes, of course, there must be intelligent life out there. And maybe they do look like us, but maybe they don't. Now, we move on a bit. This particular book is written by another minister uh, by the name of Warren. It was a very popular book around the 1880s. And uh, one of Warren's interests in writing this book was to update some of these popular astronomy books and textbooks with new information. By this time, some important things have happened. The velocity of light has been measured and is now known. And so now it's possible to talk about stellar distances in terms of what we now call a light year, but they didn't quite arrive at that term yet. But here is the only color illustration in that book and it's spectra. Major instrument that has now come into being in astronomy is the spectroscope. So separating light into colors, which allow you to identify chemical elements. And for astronomy, this is an immensely powerful tool, of course. You can not only look at an, an object through a telescope, you can actually dissect its light to find out what's there and how it's made. So this is a major, major step forward, and it's been incorporated into this popular uh, guide to astronomy, designed not particularly for students, but for lay readers. So it's a way of keeping up on the latest of the era. Now, when we get to the 1890s, about the end of the journey, this last book I want to highlight, Other Worlds and Hours, by another self-made um, astronomer, uh, Richard Proctor. He was an Englishman that came to live in the United States, and he was one of those who took up an interest in astronomy and began to spin out popular books. And for those professional astronomers of this era, like the U.S. Naval Observatory, Simon Newcomb was a famous astronomer of the time, who worked at the Naval Observatory uh, as, a, as a professional. Here's a man who's technically an amateur, but is, is recognized as a professional. His speculations tend to be more philosophical. He also has practical observing guides. Now look at this star map and compare it to the Elijah Burritt one. The, the fanciful figures of mythological creatures are now gone. So we have the stars, uh, we have other objects in the sky indicated, there's the constellation Gemini in the upper left, and uh, the constellation boundaries are indicated by these little broken lines, little boundaries, like, like they're, they're bounding private property around houses or farms. So this is what you see, and of course, this is the way you see star maps in um, astronomy books today. But look at the pretzel image in the beginning, in the middle there. I can't characterize it as anything else. One of the problems Proctor is trying to grasp is how big is this universe? And the term universe is being used here, but uh, stars by this point are no longer just fixed lights on some very distant realm, but there's something that can now be measured. For example, they now know stars have individual motions known as proper motion, and they can be measured. And that becomes a function of the Naval Observatory to measure those. Also, uh, what about this Milky Way? We can see the Milky Way, we can see through telescopes that there are stars. And if we bring in more powerful telescopes, we see stars beyond stars. So how far does this go? So uh, the Milky Way is known to be a vast region of stars. The idea that it could be a galaxy, that is a system that incorporates the sun, they're not there yet. That has not happened. Proctor rec uh, wrestles with how do you visualize a star system that's so big that you might actually be in it? How do you get out of it so you can look back and see its shape? So based on the observations available to him at the era, he thinks the Milky Way might look like something, well, like you see here. It's got arms, but not the way we normally associate them with the, with the galaxy. The word galaxy does show up in books at this time, but it's not clear that what's being referred to is a vast conglomeration of stars moving through space. But the idea that there could be other star systems like the Milky Way isn't there yet. So by the end of the 1800s, we have a universe that's still, compared to today, relatively small, but it's expanding. And people like Proctor are talking about infinity. So here's where we're at by the time we get to the end of the 1800s, the nebular hypothesis. This is the hypothesis about how things form. This is about as far as the conversation goes about how the universe was actually created. There were big gaseous clouds that condensed over time under their own gravity planets were created. And that's sort of the nebular hypothesis. 
Uh, but a nebula also applies to soft, funny, fuzzy things you see in the sky that you can't quite resolve into something more specific. And we'll see that in our tour of the sky in just a moment. Spectroscopy, I've mentioned, is a big advent. Uh, we continue to discover more asteroids throughout the century and also moons around additional planets. Even Neptune, distant Neptune, gets uh, 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 moons recognized. Um, Neptune is the outermost planet, but now that stars can uh, be measured to a degree through what's called parallax. Uh, we haven't gotten to spectroscopic measurements of velocity in space and trying to anchor that to how distant something actually is or how close it is to us. But parallax allowed ways to measure stars uh, that were at least close enough to about 300 light years. Beyond that, it was impossible to measure the actual distance to anything. So we knew by the speed of light that if you could have a star that's technically about 15 light years away, if you were out there at that star and were looking at Earth, you'd be seeing Earth the way it looked 15 years ago. And of course, from Earth, we're seeing it the way it looked 15 years ago. So again, that reminder, you've got to understand the difference between the real and the apparent when you talk about astronomy and your mind is going to be bent in new directions. Proper motion, I mentioned, speed of light. Photography has now come into play as an astronomical tool, but not the tool that it will be in just a few years into the 20th century. Uh, photography is not yet good enough to say, take plates, glass plates, and measure phenomena on those glass plates. You have to have good control over the images on the glass plates first, and they weren't there yet, but they will get there. Uh, the fragility of perception I've mentioned, which is characteristic of all these books. So why are you looking at a picture of the Battle of Waterloo? Well, these books all use techniques that astronomy books do today, since it's hard to imagine vast distances and some of the celestial phenomena that we've learned about. Neil deGrasse Tyson, Carl Sagan, they use analogies, they compare things. Uh, Carl Sagan used to use the height of the Empire State Building to represent the age of the universe, for example. Well, that Mr. Proctor you saw a moment ago had his own mind experiment to illustrate uh, the impact of understanding the speed of light and distance. He said, imagine if you were on Neptune and observing Earth and you had a very good telescope and you could see the Battle of Waterloo in progress. And you could see Napoleon looking like he was gonna win. You could see the British sort of losing out. This is just before the Austrians arrive and rescue the day. For those of you that know anything about the Battle of Waterloo, uh, he said, but what you would see is what it looked like hours ago. The whole battle has changed in the meantime, and on Earth, it's moved on. The tide of battle has turned. Napoleon is leaving the field because he's losing. So that's the way he illustrates the impact of understanding that it takes light a long time to reach Neptune. But he also has another experiment, which I found even a little bit more dazzling. He says, imagine if you were at a distant star. And you had that telescope, and you could see the Battle of Waterloo, knowing that what you're seeing might have happened 10 years ago on Earth because of the light traveling 10 years to get to your eyes. But let's say we traveled at the speed of light from where we are now all the way to Earth. If we were traveling at that speed, what would the Battle of Waterloo look like? He said, because you are traveling the speed of light, and the light coming from into your eyes is essentially operating at that speed, you're seeing a static image. It's like a freeze frame. And that's what you would see at the speed of light. So this could be the freeze frame image. But he said, what if we knock that down a little bit and we're traveling almost the speed of light? What would we see? He says, you'd see the action slowing down. You'd see all the soldiers movements slowing down, maybe even reaching a stopping point and reversing in time. Now that's a heck of a thing to say in the 19th century, but that's the kind of speculation we're getting. And that's decades before Einstein and relativity. Proctor has just reasoned this based on his understanding of the velocity of light and its limitations for understanding astronomy. So let's take a quick tour through the telescope of Professor Mitchell. And I'm not talking about Mariah Mitchell here. This is another Mitchell with one L. And let's pick the year 1870 for this. And it's this noble looking guy, Ormsby McKnight Mitchell. If you haven't heard that name, I should tell you that Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson are both the Ormsby McKnight Mitchell 
of the 20th and 21st centuries. That's how important this guy is. He uh, self-taught uh, mostly, but he was a child prodigy, got a basic good education, but he got into West Point, which had the best science and engineering school in the country. And he became a whiz at math. Uh, he had learned a bunch of languages on his own, pretty much, and was an army officer. But they brought him back to West Point because he was so good as a teacher and he was so good a mathematician, he started teaching math as a professor there. But he moved away from that, became a lawyer, but he never lost his fascination with astronomy. And he ended up moving to Cincinnati, where he was a lawyer and also helped develop a railroad. And uh, he started writing astronomy books. And you see two of them here. Popular Astronomy and Planetary and Stellar Worlds. Both of these appeared before uh, the Civil War. I've got ownership signatures on both of them. Uh, the one, Emmanuel Montgomery Jones, who owned the book right above it, 1859, I've been able to find out was a landowner in Eastern Virginia, probably a plantation owner with enslaved people, who happened to like this book. And uh, McKnight Mitchell founded two observatories. He found one in Cincinnati, the one you see in color, and one in New York, the one on the left. Now, he didn't have a lot of means to do this, but he was such a popular lecturer. Uh, people came to his lectures because he developed a special lantern slide projection system to show marvelous illustrations of things. And so um, he uh, showed these dazzling astronomy lectures. He became such an important lecturer, he brought in as many as 4,000 people to a single lecture about his astronomy. So, civil war happens. They bring him back in and make him a general, send him into the Western theater where he's supposed to intercept and take over railroads that the Confederacy's now got. And he's known as Old Stars because of his astronomy background by his soldiers. Now, uh, his Civil War exploit that was newsworthy was called the Great Locomotive Chase, where he sent down some soldiers sort of undercover to hijack a train from the Confederacy, run it back north, stopping to burn bridges on the way. Problem was the Confederates got on him right away and they followed him. There was a high speed locomotive chase for about hundred miles. And uh, this event was the basis for a Buster Keaton silent movie called The General. And I highly recommend this film. I think it's one of Buster Keaton's best. And you know, he does his own stunts and they are definitely death defying. So he plays a lone Confederate locomotive operator who chases down those Union saboteurs who take a train and escape with it. So the telescope for our brief tour will be the one in Cincinnati Observatory, which has been restored and is used for amateur use. There's an illustration from Elijah Burritt showing readers. Here's one of the great telescopes of our era. So of course, any observing night has to start with the moon if it's up. And here's a drawing by Mitchell. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the geology of the moon, it's believed that there are some very deep chasms that go miles and miles deep between mountain ranges and craters. Uh, the idea that the craters are formed by volcanic action is discussed. Uh, they are ancient from meteor impacts is also discussed. There's also the possibility the moon might, moon might be inhabited. We don't know, although it's recognized it obviously doesn't have an atmosphere. But it's clearly a crowd pleaser for any observing night. Now I'm showing you here both images from Mitchell's drawings, an image from a telescope showing a comparable point of view, and a Hubble illustration. So Mars is, of course, an, a place that gives rise to a lot of imaginings. And it's in the 1870s, of course, where the whole canal idea comes up, that there are roadways on Mars, not necessarily canals, but roadways, and maybe the dark areas are big agricultural areas. Uh, whether it's inhabited or not is not really a serious astronomy question. But uh, people do notice it has the seasons, and people do think that Mars is most likely an Earth-like planet, more so than the other ones. Now, Jupiter, of course, in a small telescope can be amazing to see because of its colorful cloud bands. And the Hubble telescope to the lower right shows what, what we're missing if we're not in orbit around Jupiter. But you can still see a great deal in a smaller telescope or an observatory telescope like Mitchell's. So here you see an illustration of what to expect with the recognition that we're probably not seeing an actual surface of a planet, but there's something going on creating these clouds which seem to be long lasting in their configuration. And of course, Saturn has its special thing, the ring, which they did think was an unformed moon, uh, some sort of rubble plane that's very thin uh, that the earth sometimes passes into that plane of the rings where they go invisible. Uh, but they're observing this. They see that there are different rings within the ring. 
But Saturn is like Jupiter, an impenetrable planet, cannot see a surface to it. Now, we talked about the Milky Way. This is the impression that uh, Mitchell has of the Milky Way. It's, it's stars. It's a lot of stars. Exactly where we fit into the picture, we don't know. The illustration on lower left is an artist's illustration of what the Milky Way looks like to us now. That sort of barred feature right here is something that was added to our perception of our own galaxy just within the last generation. And it has these spiral arms. So this is a configuration that is still not available to 19th century astronomers. Now, they are seeing stars in these nebulosities that seem to be resolved through telescope into big conglomerations of stars. And by the way, Mitchell uses the term island universe for this many times. This is an island universe of many, many, many stars in some kind of a conglomeration, exactly where it fits in the overall structure of things, we just don't know. So you get a nice image down below. We now call it Messier 13, but this nomenclature was not in use in America at the time. Crab Nebula also presents a challenge because it's one of those nebulas that has a strange shape, but we cannot quite yet rationalize what it is. The fact that it's actually the remnant of an exploding star is a realization that's a few decades away, as you see in the color illustration. So there's an idea that Mitchell thought he could see some stars somewhere in the middle of this thing, but exactly what it is, you could not say. And ditto the Orion Nebula, which would have been visible to the naked eye. And in the lower left, this is a pretty close approximation of a telescopic view today, and the drawing that Mitchell made of this. And we know now, as you see on the right and here, uh, frequently described as a stellar nursery and uh, gas illuminated by the stars embedded in it. And the Great Andromeda Galaxy, another, the closest galaxy to us, big spiral galaxy, is still big nebulosity. And the image up, up left has got some little streaky uh, lines in it. That's just the imperfection of printing. But this could not be resolved as stars at the time. So there was no idea whether this is some little phenomenon within a close distance to Earth, whether it's distant, what? People are not yet conceiving of Milky Ways beyond the Milky Way, other galaxies. That is something that will be realized in a few decades. So we conclude the evening, and uh, uh, Ormsby McKnight Mitchell's parting word from his book would be this, that all the phenomena of nature are connected, all flow from a few simple and general laws, and the task of the man of genius consists in discovering those secret connections, those unknown relations which connect the phenomena which appear to the vulgar to have no analogy. So I want to thank you and show you this rather uh, sexy version of the Muse of Astronomy. But I'm gonna jump ahead before the, the questions to show you two other images because one is uh, an appeal for interest. Uh, one is, I should get Mariah Mitchell in here to have a good word. In 1876, she gave an important speech that was published called The Need for Women in Astronomy. And this speaks to the kinds of things she said to her students. But also here in Philadelphia, we have uh, Central High School, this is the building they used to have. It was demolished. They had an observatory, which was a major functioning observatory in the United States. It was destroyed in a fire. Now, Central High School now uh, does not have an observatory, but it had in the 1800s the most, uh, the best physics laboratory in the country. Hmm. And uh, this telescope formed part of that. In the library of Central High School today, there are some bits and pieces from those old days, some old pieces of uh, demonstration apparatus. And this telescope, I discovered, is sitting in a corner in the library with a lot of junk piled next to it. This poor old refractor. Any of you have an inclination to get involved with this and contact the library at uh, uh, Central High School, maybe there's an opportunity to get this in operating condition again. It's a pity to see an old telescope like this stuck in a corner when it could be used. But I'll go back here and over to you folks. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Robert, that was great. Wow, thank you, Robert. I just have to say that um, oh, I've, ha I've had some friends visiting in from uh, across the country uh, who were extremely excited uh, and very interested with the stuff that Robert had to say. Um, so Robert, thank you very much. 
Um, you have once again impressed us, as you always do, um, one of our favorite presenters. Um, I did, in fact, look for my copy of Voyage to Jamestown, but I could not yet find my signed copy. Um, I have a copy somewhere. Uh, but on behalf of the society, I'd like to thank you for accepting our invitation, for coming out this evening, and for giving us an absolutely amazing presentation uh, for myself and for everyone present. Uh, I hope you have a great night, and we can't wait to see what you do next. I know there's all sorts of crazy Thanks. stuff coming up. Uh, also, I would like to mention as a side note that um, Robert is studying bonsai with my mother-in-law. And um, so one of the things he's doing is not astronomy. It is studying bonsai. So um, grow slowly, Robert. <laughs> okay. I, you know, I did promise to tell you about the man who got stuck in the telescope. I was going to ask about that too. Okay. Uh, that was at the Naval Observatory, that 26 inch telescope that you saw. What happened was um, uh, observatories, as everybody here knows, are not heated or cooled because of the atmospheric turbulence that it would produce. Uh, one August in hot, muggy Washington, D.C., it was time to remove the lens, the achromatic lens, at the end of that tube, inspect it, clean it, and uh, uh, make some other adjustments in the telescope. And so uh, the telescope was, nobody was to be around that day. And the, the technician who did this uh, had the telescope uh, in a horizontal position. He used a ladder to get up there and remove the lens. And it was so hot and so sweaty, he stripped down to his shorts. And after he got the lens off, he would into the tube uh, because there were some electronic uh, sensors in the tube that needed to be adjusted. And he got stuck. So his head and his shoulders were stuck in there and the rest of his body hanging out in his skivvies. <laughs> uh, the Naval Observatory today is located in a nice little secluded area uh, bounded by a wall and the residence, the official residence of the Vice President of the United States is on those grounds. So that's where Kamala Harris lives next to that, that telescope. And uh, there was a VIP visit that involved somebody on the vice president's staff that day and uh, some naval uh, bigwigs, some admirals, and they asked to be taken in to see the 26 inch telescope. So they went <laughs> and encountered this guy in his shorts hanging out of the telescope tube, um, desperately trying to get out of it. And so they came in and just beheld this phenomenon of a uh, half naked man, mostly naked man standing there stuck in a telescope. Uh, when I was giving tours of the 26 inch, uh, one of the astronomers had told me this and I was telling the story thinking, oh, this happened a long time ago. This is a funny story. And then one day I was introduced to, to a colleague on the faculty, on the staff of the Naval Observatory who was the very man this happened to. Uh. <laughs> I stopped telling the story <laughs> at that point. Uh, but when I was introduced to him, he says, this is the man that got stuck in the telescope. And, uh, that was a day. So Mike, uh, you got you got to watch what stories you tell about the Franklin as you're walking around. Yeah. <laughs> you never oh, know. <laughs> Robert, this is definitely giving me a new perspective on the stories I'm going to tell. But thank you for answering my my immense curiosity about how that happened. So appreciate it. Sure, Robert. During your talk, I had to bite my tongue when you were talking about the rigor in the introductory astronomy book, astronomy books. Th that has been the debate of many people here including it, it even got into, if you look at early Boy Scout and Girl Scout mm -hmm. uh, astronomy requirements, mm -hmm. you would think they were going for a doctoral thesis compared to what we challenge our students to do today. Yeah. Um, it's an amazingly different world. Uh, we all teach very differently. Uh, I had a long teaching career and the way we taught in the beginning versus the way we taught in the end, I, I don't know if we've got it right, but I guess America really is an amazing experiment <laughs> and education is the, at the forefront of that experiment. We'll have to see. I, I, don't, I don't think yeah. the jury's out yet on how effective today's education is going to be. Yeah. 
But again, thanks. And um, I, I didn't see any questions come in. So if you want to hang for a bit and we'll see if some more questions come up. But I, I want to move along because of time tonight also. Sure. Uh, I'd like to introduce you guys to Denise. Uh, Denise is our vice president. And if you're just tuning in, you're with the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. I'd like to welcome our worldwide audience on YouTube. Um, we have two college groups in the house. Shout out to Arcadia University. Shout out to also Millersville University. One in Glenside, one over in Lancaster. Um, we're the Rittenhouse Astronomy Society, and we used to be based mainly at the Franklin, and now we've merged into a lot of activity out at Muddy Run or uh, Ryan Observatory, Muddy Run Park. After Denise talks and after Dave talks, I'd like to entice you all to hang in there. Um, we need to drum up some volunteers, and I'm going to show people how they might want to get involved with something like this. So, is, Denise. Is me, Ted? Yep. I'm sorry, Ted. Uh, I may not <laughs> stick with you all the way to the end, but. That's all right. Okay, no problem. I, you know what, though, Robert, I, I'm going to put an invite out there I want you to consider. We also do uh, s uh, smaller presentations out at uh, Ryan Observatory, and we do it at every one of our live events. So if you'd be interested, you could even do partially the same presentation if you wanted to, because we get a, a very different audience out there in the Lancaster area. It'd be a great night to bring your family out and you could come out for an open house for one of us. So, you know, Thanks. don't lose touch with us. We still could uh, use you okay. <laughs> to right, spread Ted. the interest in astronomy also. Okay, you. so Denise, you want to take over for a bit and do a little bit of our planet report? I sure can. Um Thanks, Ted. And thanks, Robert. There are a couple of comments. People loved your talk. So check the chat. And if anybody has any questions, you can always, um, you know, chat to Robert through the chat function. So hopefully you guys will uh, take advantage of that. So um, I'm here just to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the night sky. And I did want to say, it was funny, Robert, when you were doing your presentation, we still do that moon on a stick presentation to this day. Um, that is something that teachers, when you're working with kids, it's a great one. Uh, pull out the moon on a stick and, and a lamp, and yeah. there you go. Except then it was probably a candle. So, um, and uh, you know, so fa so fascinating that uh, you know this things these things still work after all these years. Um, but that's the beauty of the sky, right? Because it's pretty much in our lifetimes never changing. So there you go. Um, Speaking of the sky, everybody, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to open up Sky Safari so we can, I should have it opened already and I have it set for now. It's funny because when I originally opened the program, it was still light. It was uh, sky blue. And as you can see, it's getting a little darker. It gets dark pretty late now. And as we head into summer, it's going to be almost after nine before it's dark. But you can see plenty out there uh, on a clear night by 830, uh, particularly the moon. We have a full moon coming up this weekend, uh, Saturday. So as I say every month, those of you that are uh, werewolves, you have that to prepare for. So get yourself together because Saturday night is going to be a busy one. Um, but as you can see, it is in uh, right around the end of the constellation of Leo heading into the constellation of Virgo. And let me like zoom in just a little bit so you can see it just a wee bit better. And I noticed every picture of the sky that, Robert shown it was the constellation of Orion. It's one of the easiest recognizable um, constellations and just about every culture in the world saw that shape in the sky as some sort of standing man in the sky. And the Greeks uh, who uh, named it uh, after Orion, the great hunter, uh, they saw him up there in the sky. Uh, we can see what Orion looks like if we zoom in. And he is chasing the bull and they are constellations of winter still hanging out in the sky around sunset. So you'll be able to see them for a couple more weeks and then we're going to lose Orion in the glare of the sun. So if you want to see Orion, the Orion Nebula, the wonderful armpit star, Betelgeuse, the Pleiades, any of that kind of stuff uh, from the winter, it's your time to get out now because they're going to vanish by May and then we won't see them again until the end of the year. So uh, what else can we see? Well, Capella, one of my favorite, actually my favorite star is still up there. It's a yellow star like our sun, but it's 
pretty much nothing like our sun. Uh, it's actually a multiple star system. We only have one star. We have planets, but I don't know if there's planets around Capella. Wouldn't that be interesting to wake up and to two sunrises? I think that would be uh, fantastic. And it's actually um, a couple of stars. It's a multiple star system. So not just a binary, which means two. Uh, there are a couple of other, uh, a couple of red dwarfs and stuff around that uh, star as well. So a multiple star system. Uh, Robert was also talking about the Big Dipper. Now we all know, because uh, we've been all doing it forever, that the Big Dipper is actually just an asterism. And if I put my asterisms up here, okay, I got to get away from that. I wish that would go up. Um, we can see that the Big Dipper is an asterism. So anything in red there is considered a catch figure in the sky. And it is true. Uh, the Big Dipper always points to Polaris, the North Star. A lot of people think it's the brightest star in the sky. However, Polaris is, I think it's like the 48th brightest star in the sky. So that's not why Polaris is important. If I move time, let's uh, put Polaris right at the top. And as you can see, it's right under the end for North Pole. And I move time, we can see how all the stars look like they're rotating around the star Polaris. It's the only one that stays still. Now, that's an illusion. It's really the Earth that's turning. And the way our axis is tilt, that's kind of like the imaginary line going through the Earth. It points out into space. It just so happens to point to Polaris. So it's the only star that always remains fixed to our eyes here on planet earth. Uh, everything else seems to move because the earth is turning. So things look like they rise in the east, move across the sky and set in the west. And as you can see, if I stop time, we're at tomorrow. Uh, we can see that the moon has shifted a little bit because the moon is also moving. It's going around the earth. So we're in this dance together uh, out there in outer space. And there's a few other asterisms out there you want to take note of. Uh, so not just the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, which are part of the Big Bear and the Little Bear. But if you arc to Arcturus, you come to the kite or the ice cream cone or uh, whatever you want to think of it to be. It's a nice little catch figure. The name Arcturus means bear chaser. And this guy actually, let's move it forward a little bit so we can see what he looked like. He actually is chasing the big bear and the little bear around the sky. Now, Arcturus is one of the brightest stars of spring. So you go out, you look up almost at the zenith, which is the tippy top of the sky. You're going to see that star Arcturus. So astronomers like to say, arc your way to Arcturus. Then you can hike it a spica after that, which is the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo, the maiden. And that's where the moon will be tomorrow night. The moon will always be in one of the constellations of the zodiac. In fact, that's where you find the sun, the moon, and the planets. Now, something else Robert talked about is the great globular cluster in Hercules. I uh, had that Messier number. I want to say Messier 31. Is, am I right? Or am I wrong? I can't remember. Um, I just forget the M numbers. I'm going to call it the great globular cluster in Hercules. And Hercules is another asterism. It's a keystone uh, right up here. And Pennsylvania, we're the Keystone State. And if you go up here, we can see the Hercules cluster uh, right around there. So that is a globular cluster, a big glob of stars. And they these globular clusters orbit around the outer parts of the galaxy. By the way, galaxy means milky. It's an old Greek word. Uh, that's where the name galaxy comes from. That's why probably we call it the Milky Way to this day. And it was believed that it was Hercules who actually, um, his milk, when he was a baby, he was so strong, he bit down when he was feeding and milk sprayed up into the sky. And that's how the Milky Way got its name. And we can see the Milky Way best in the summertime. So real quick, I'm just going to set this back to now because I want to go to tomorrow morning. Because tomorrow morning, we're going to have a whole line of planets. Uh, you can kind of start seeing Mercury in the evening at sunset. I was never impressed when I saw Mercury. And I hate to say that because some people, I know somebody out there is going to get mad at me for saying it, but I waited like 30 years to see Mercury. And when I saw it, I was like, meh. 
what you want to look for is the morning right now. So when you're getting up to go to school, to work, whatever, look up in the sky because right before sunrise, we have some planets. Yeah, you can see Pluto down there, but you're going to need a pretty big telescope. But if you look right in the morning, right as the sun is coming up, we have Saturn, Mars, bright Venus, Jupiter, and even Neptune, if you want to get your telescope out. But you don't need a telescope. You can see four beautiful planets. Venus will be the brightest of them. It's got a magnitude of uh, minus 4.4 or something like that. And you might say, well, minus, that doesn't sound very uh, bright. But in astronomy, the smaller the number, the brighter the star. So if you're looking at something that's a minus, it's going to be way brighter than something that is a magnitude of four, which will be pretty dim. And I probably wouldn't be able to see it without my glasses uh, or a dark sky, but you'll be able to see Saturn, no problem. Mars will look red. It's probably going to be the dimmest of all of them. Saturn's going to be kind of dim, but Jupiter and Venus are going to be your bright morning celestial beacons uh, to welcome a new day before our star, the sun, rises again. So hopefully you'll get up and enjoy that sky show in the morning. I'm going to stop sharing uh, and bring us back. Hopefully uh, you guys have uh, thought of some other things to ask. And, uh, you know, hopefully you'll get out and enjoy some of the sky. Hey, thank you very much, Denise. Oop, let me meet Thanks, Ted. Here. No problem. Um, Dave, are you out there somewhere? Yeah, I think I'm out you're here. there. Okay. If you turn your camera on, if you're just joining us, everybody, we're the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. Nice profile pick, Dave. A little bit update there. Um, That's actually up at Cherry Springs years ago with Dr. Zoidberg. Wow. Well, you've just heard from Denise Vecca, our vice president, also mistress of the universe for us. I'd like <laughs> to throw it over now to Dave Walker. Dave Walker does a little bit of rocket science with us and keeps us up on our mission update. Dave, you want to take it away? And with all the activity happening these days, it's getting harder and harder to uh, keep abreast, but I'll give you my best. Of okay. course, today is 13 April 2022. And oh, I'm terrible with math. Uh, 41 years ago, the first reusable spacecraft to carry a human crew, ask me about the first that didn't, later uh, launched into space, and that was the space shuttle Columbia from the Kennedy Space Center, carrying two, two pilots into space on one of its first test missions. That was 20 years to the day after a Ukrainian rocket launched from Kazakhstan in South Central Eurasia, carried a test payload built in Russia to orbit the Earth. Now, the first six space shuttle missions actually carried ejection seats that were based on those that were used by military airplane like the SR-71 spycraft. They were never used. On the other hand, the ejection seat on Vostok 1, the Ukrainian rocket, was used to eject the payload to land separately by parachute. Where are we going with this? <laughs> it's been long debated in the astronomic circles. The rules for the first successful human space flight indicated that they had to land with their vehicle. Yuri Gagarin parachuted down, but by general consensus, he is considered the first person to orbit the Earth and return safely. And a while ago, I said I'd be doing a little more history. There's going to be some rocket news update at the end because there's a lot going on this week, very important. But let's go back into history while I bring up my presentation. One amendment, please. There we go. There we go. Okay. So this is our rocket report for this month, the Giant Falls. And a little background, if you're seeing the picture of gray in my beard, you can probably guess about how old I am. The year I was born, humans went to the moon. They didn't land on it. That was later. But they went. That was Apollo 8. 
growing up as a young boy, <laughs> I watched the Apollo program live on TV and was fascinated. So let me now take you, if I may, on a strange journey. <laughs> the Soviet Union was notoriously secretive about their space program. They were very public about their successes, but very, very secretive about their failures. In fact, it was sensors that were used to detect atomic explosions that found out that the Soviets lost several of their moon rockets that they admitted they didn't have. But we knew better. One of the things that we did eke out is when they were successful, whoop, back, is after July of uh, 1969, the Soviets completely denied having a, space, a, a moon landing program at all. But what they did announce was the first satellite, the Salyut Soyuz program and Al Almaz, the Luna landers and Luncon rovers, and one of the Luna landers actually performed a soil return mission in 1971. So our Apollo astronauts were not the only people bringing lunar regolith back to the Earth. And what fascinated me most was the mysterious Venera missions landing on that cloudy, hellish planet. And of course, their attempts to reach the red planet Mars. Information was very tight, very tight. But as a young person with stars in my eyes, pun intended, I soaked up every little scrap of information I could. In fact, I'm a charter member of the Smithsonian Air and Space Magazine. And in the early days, in the back, they actually had a list of space launches and they published a uh, sort of poster that you could write in the launch and return of vehicles. December 1999, the Iron Curtain falls. And it began. The flood of information out of the very secretive Soviet Union. Books, articles, magazines, reports. It all became bit by bit, but over time, very available. I was fascinated. I would spend so much time in science bookstores. I bought every book and re read every article I could get my hands on. My bookshelf is still creaking to this day from that. And one of the things that stood out, because you know we knew Apollo pretty well and all the technical achievements and those big engines and all the materials that were invented to support it. The Soviet material science wasn't as good, but I marveled, marveled at how they overcame the deficiencies in material science and sheer horsepower by truly elegant mathematical solutions. They had legendary chief designers. We had Werner von Braun. They had Korolev, Chelomi, and Kutnestov. True geniuses of their era. Korolev is the Ukrainian father of the Soviet space program. He was there von Braun. He was also put into the gulag several times to increase his performance. Between the Apollo program and the fall of the wall, things started to change. The United States and the Soviet Union decided that it would be better to explore space together. I mean, both programs were incredibly expensive. So in 1975, the last Apollo program happened and it had nothing to do with the moon. It was the Apollo Soyuz test program where a US space capsule docked in orbit with a Soviet space capsule. And you can see in the picture here, the famous Apollo on the left and the very typical now Soyuz capsule over there on the right. But notice the size difference between the capsules. The Soyuz is divided into two parts. The round bit stays in orbit. The little bit with the Soviet flag would land. That's what they're still using today, though, in modified form. 
And the thing in between is a docking adapter because they used different atmospheres. That's another story for another day. But this detente in 75 led in the 1990s to the shuttle Mir program you see in the lower left corner, where our US space shuttle docked to their Almaz derivative spacecraft, the Mir space station, setting many records for the time, ultimately leading to today's International Space Station, the core of which the functional cargo block, Zarya, is also the core of Mir. In fact, it was a uh, backup for Mir or a later version of Mir that they converted to use for the space station. It was an exhilarating decade. The Russians, now no longer part of the Soviet Union, which no longer exists, and the United States are cooperating with other international partners in space. It was a heady time. Their geniuses, our geniuses, a fusion of technology and culture, and hopefully the opening and welcoming of this much secretive society into a much more open and democratic and free world. Well, did I just skip one? Yep, okay. My connection's a bit slow, so if it's a bit jerky, forgive me. Things started to change in the early mid 21st century. In the space shuttle was eventually retired. As we know, we've met the final commander of the space shuttle on STS-135. And the, our only way to the space station was with, for passengers, crew, was the Ukrainian Soyuz rocket. I'm giving credit where credit is due for those keeping notes. But in 2012, something remarkable happened. The first privately developed, although with some government backing, the SpaceX cargo crew dragon over there on, or freight dragon over there on the right, docked with the International Space Station. And it is one of several robotic freighters that dock, including the Russian Progress, uh, the Japanese HTV, and the European uh, Leonardo craft. In 2020, things got more exciting when the first crewed Dragon, seen here on the left, docked with the space station, carrying a test crew. In 2021, though, the first operational crew arrived, and the Soyuz is losing its charm. The Dragon is more advanced, more capable and carry four people in more comfortable compared to the three in a very cramped Soyuz capsule. But wait, there's more. A long time ago, I did a presentation on the Apollo program and its development. And one of the things that brought it down was political changes in the United States and the economic and social costs. Russia in the early to current 2000s is dealing with the same thing. Their leaders, Vladimir Putin and Dmitry Medvedev, have been eroding at what we would call democratic norms and recreating a society almost as oppressive as the old Soviet Union was, becoming more authoritarian and regressive. Our dreams of joining them as an open democratic and free society have been strangled. And one of the other victims, and I am in no way, no way devaluing the human victims, but one of the victims was their space program. The great designers are gone. The current leader, Dmitry Rogozin, trampoline man, is a political appointee, a friend of Putin, but really has no business or rocket science pedigree. The once mighty Russian Soviet space program is now withering on the vine. They did have a few last hurrahs. Anyone remember this thing? We had our 747s to carry our shuttles. They built a special carrier craft, the Antonov 125. And in the early 90s, I had a chance to see it. I was picking up gifts sent by my family from Canada to the United States, uh, the Philadelphia airport, and I'm driving on a back road to the freight pickup site, and I see this huge white fin 
with a flag on it. And I'm like, what is that? I drive around and this thing is sitting on the runway at Philadelphia International carrying uh, medical relief supplies back to the former Soviet Union. So I was late for work, but it was worth it to watch this thing take off. There's only one of them in the world. Uh, well, there was one of them in the world. In February, 2022, it was destroyed when invading Russian forces destroyed the Antonov airfield in Ukraine. And yeah, like the uh, Vostok rocket, this was also a product of Ukrainian genius. The 225 that carried the, the shuttle craft was called the Mriya, my Ukrainian's terrible, apologize, meaning dream. And it was the largest, heaviest aircraft ever to operate. There have been bigger and heavier, but never in commercial operation. There are hopes that it will be rebuilt, but for now it is just smoldering wreckage on a Ukrainian airfield. But let's land on some good news. Here's our friend, the Space Launch System. Much delayed, many opinions about it, but this month they finally rolled it out to Launch Complex 39 at Kennedy Space Center, one of the reformatted Apollo sites, to begin a wet dress rehearsal to prepare it for its first flight, which honestly probably won't take till 2023. But the idea is they take it out to the pad, they run a full setup right down to T minus 10 seconds, filling it with fuel, checking the systems, powering up all this electronics. And they've had a few problems between bad weather and a stuck helium valve, it is now delayed. Nothing critical, but this mighty craft has found yet a, another setback. Let's keep our fingers crossed. And this is one of the best pictures I could find. It was from the New York Times, just that beautiful reflection in the uh, water next to the flight path. There's been another success. Let's go back to that Crew Dragon. It's a public-private partnership, but mostly a privately developed spacecraft. And earlier this week, it carried the first totally commercial crew up to the International Space Station. It's Axiom 1. For, at, for we're not sure what to call them, the astronauts, they're not quite tourists, so we don't know what to call them, but they flew to the space station. And they're the four in the dark shirts in the middle. Former na astronaut Michael Lopez, Algeria, Larry Connor from Ohio, USA, Mark Pathy from Canada, and Etienne Stibbe, who is the second astronaut in our program from Israel. And that's notable because, regrettably, the first U.S. Israeli astronaut, Jan Ramon, perished in the destruction of the Columbia orbiter back in 2003. So keep our fingers crossed for these people. There is much more going on in space, but keeping to time, I want to end it here. So this is Dave Walker, secretary and historian, saying for this month, that's what's up. Thank you very much, David. It's interesting, this war and the varied perspectives that you can take upon it. None of them all that great, believe me, but <clears throat> I was talking with a friend it the other day. It's not my job to be political, but I sometimes know. politics runs afoul of our aspirations. Uh, the war really is trying on everybody. Uh, if there's one thing I, I try to pull out of it, and there's nothing good from it, but... The one thing I feel is after being old enough to witness a couple of these wars on my nighttime television, I am so inspired at how the global community is coming together and how the global community, a global village is really putting pressure on Russia. Um, I think this is amazing. I, I'm sorry to say it took such a kick in the gut for it to be able to happen, but I think the global village is awakening and it took this horror for it to actually happen. Okay, so wait, let's stop on a good note. And boy, I lost our viewers. So we've, we're down in numbers and maybe I should have put this on earlier, everybody. But 
um, I was going to say, hey, we finally get to get together and we get to go out and we go to an observatory. So what I did is inside your chat room, if you all see that, there's a document link right there. That takes you to a Google document that I'm going to share with you just now if I can do this. So let's see. And why do I lose that button when every time when I need it? Hold on a second. Uh, I don't want to do that. You know what it is? You put the chat room up and it actually takes away uh, button space here. So uh, give me a second and let me figure out what's going on here. Um, how about all of you go ahead and press that document if you want to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can press it. And let me see if I can take this away from us. Close. There we go. And there's the share screen button. Okay. So I'm bringing it up also uh, in front of you. Uh, you should be able to see it maybe right now. Give me a thumbs up if you do see it. And it looks kind of confusing. I'm going to go over it real quickly for you. And what this is, is this document here is how we sign up. Um, if you notice, um, we had a ticket event on April 2nd. That'll be taken off the list shortly. But here it is, April 23rd, our open house. And what you do is you go down below here and you sign your name in down below. If you can put your phone number in there, that would really be appreciated because um, those of us who can use this and we're on site, we can actually open our phone. We can see everybody's phone number there and we can tap on that and reach you if we need to. So it helps us. Um, this document is not going to be put online. So you don't have to worry about phone numbers being compromised. It will be available to other volunteers. So it works pretty simply. You just go into whatever open house you'd like to work with or whatever binocular tour we're giving, and you can sign up there too. What are the different roles that people can actually play here? Well, if we, if we think of this, and I hate to say it, like uh, we're running an amusement park, we have three attractions. And the more people we have volunteer and train, the more attractions we can operate. Um, if we wanted to run everything out there for an open house, it was recommended by our observatory committee that we'd like to have four greeters in the visitor center, uh, two educators, maybe two presenters on site. We are in need of uh, four uh, operator assistants in the observatory, and that's if we don't open the binocular scope. We're in need of six assistants if we open the binocular scope. If you feel that you can put a laser and take it out of your pocket and do some sky interpretation, you can then get involved there. If you have no astronomy um, background whatsoever and you still wanna get involved, we need people in the visitor center who help with crowd flow. We may have up to a hundred people that we have to put into a small auditorium in the back or we're directing them to the outdoor amphitheater. Dan saw the category at the beginning of the meeting, he signed on as a troubleshooter. Those are the people we use to run around and try to figure out where they need help at different parts. Um, and we also have as many people as we can get. If you look down here, the private telescope set up. Um, if you can bring a scope up and set it up around the observatory, uh, please know you're welcome to do that. And if you can't figure out where you fit into any of this right here, put your name under general volunteer and we'll try to figure it out for you. Okay, now one last thing. You also need to know maybe how do you get your training to do some of this stuff? Well, the one tab was the volunteer registration list. Look at the top here, volunteer event of uh, registration. The other tab is when we're doing uh, training. Now, this one's not going out to the public. This is for all of you. You've got the link now. I'm the only one right now who's doing training out there. Um, we'll see some other people uh, signing on with this. And next training is tomorrow, April 9th. I'll be out there and I can do the training at day or night. People would get in touch with me if they wanted to do this. I'm throwing another date out, April 14th. I'm throwing another one out, April 19th. And people are already signing up for the 19th. On the 19th, by the way, that evening, um, we're going to try to have a live uh, astro, zoo, or astro Cora from the observatory. And if anybody's out there, we'll put you on too. I know it's kind of confusing. So Denise has also offered that if you just want to give her your name and she'll put it in on the data chart for you, that we can do also. What we're trying to do, though, is we're trying to get off the idea that one person has to do all of this data entry. Um, this is a Google editable sheet. And if you go to, let's say, voter for registration, like Fern, if you were coming out to one of the open houses, you might just want to put down general volunteer, or if you want to sign on as an educator presenter, because I know you usually do stuff with kids, you could put your name in right there. So 
One of the reasons we're asking you to volunteer and sign up in advance is because I've been informed now that we are no longer providing the food uh, for the volunteers. Um, uh, Constellation will be providing the food and Nikki from Constellation will actually be setting up that food area. Um, Denise, do you know what time you'd like our volunteers to show up that night? Um, yeah, we, we would like to start eating at six o'clock. So if everybody could get there around six o'clock, that would be wonderful because our event starts at eight. So we figured a couple hours to uh, review, see where everybody's going to hang out and what, you know, what their posts are going to be, uh, if we need help setting up anything uh, and time to eat and socialize before the event. So um, food is included. Now here's the get go. If you sign up at the very last minute or you decide that day to come out, you're more than welcome to do it, but don't expect to have food there for you. We really have to tell them a day or two in advance. That's going to be by Friday afternoon of how much pizza or how much salad to order. It's kind of like a finger food. So, you know, we can do that there. So you now all have the link and you're also going to be mailed this link. And you're going to have two opportunities. One is you go directly to the sheet and sign in yourself. That's the preferred way we'd like you to do it. And the other way would be email or contact Denise. I'll do it myself also, but we'll put your name in. But if you contact me, I'm going to try to teach you how to do it yourself and <laughs> put your name in on the data chart. Um, we don't have the staff in the background, everybody, hundreds of people to sit and do all that data and tabulation. So uh, our volunteers have to step up just a bit and see if they can sign up that way. Anything you think I've missed on that, Denise? Um, no, um, I just got a message from Dave saying he cannot be there. So um, we won't Walker. have a rocket report, but okay, okay, you'll be there next time, Dave. Though, right? Yeah. Um, I do want to add that. Yeah, if you're no, it's, it's of... we, we 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 have a technical maintenance that works, so I can't be there. I I will be uh, working on our phone system. So yeah. if that's so okay, if, we don't expect everyone to beat everyone. Every, every, you know. That's that's okay. And if Lydell sees this or um, uh, Roxanne sees this, um, Roxanne, Lydell, if you would like to do a fifteen-minute presentation, please get in touch with us because you're just as qualified as we are to do it. Uh, I don't um, think they're here. They're not. Neither yeah. of them are here. But Denise, this is all going on YouTube and people do watch it the following day. So, oh, okay. Well, then please, I'm, I'm hoping that they okay. might get it here also. And I'll also try to contact them myself. So if you guys want to turn your cameras on and spend a few minutes and you want to talk now, you're more than welcome to. I don't want to shut down the, the thing, but I also know we ran pretty late. I'm looking at our time on this on already 921. So um, I'll say goodnight if some people are signing out right now. That's great. Again, we really hope to see some of you out there at the park. Um, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to seeing live people again. And I will say one thing, because Al asked me a couple times to make sure, um, and I lost my prop, uh, masks are still going to be required if you're inside the black fenced-in area. Am I looking good? I kind of got to go back to this style again, but if you're inside... If you're inside the uh, Rhode Island iron railing, uh, that's where it gets kind of tight. We're going to ask you to mask up. We're going to limit 10 people in the observatory at a time, keeping the doors and the roof open also. So in the observatory, we'll be masked and anywhere who's inside the, uh, the, the, the black fence that surrounds us. Outside of that area, you're on your own. You're okay. Um, we're not going to assault anybody or, or mandate it. We're just going to request that people wear masks like that. We still have some volunteer operators that would like people to be masked inside the dome. Now, I think I've covered everything. So Andrew, if you're into this and you want to bring your telescope out, you finally have an opportunity. Who knows if you're working that weekend or not. But remember, we have a whole bunch of them coming up. And you'll also see, not only will I put in these, uh, you'll see on that, if you go to that Google spreadsheet, um, there'll be some more observing opportunities sure. also. That means the observatory won't be open necessarily, but you can bring your telescope out and set it up for the view. Okay. That's one of the perks of being a volunteer. You get to... Mm -hmm. Yes. Hang out and there when nobody else is there. So remember the music, the amusement park analogy. 
Um, so we have three attractions. Imagine like three roller coasters. One's the Big Dipper, that's Dome One. The next coaster would be uh, Space Mountain and Kunda Ka. Kunda Ka would be how I'd equate our uh, binocular telescope to. We're going to need six volunteers all trained to run that if we do that properly. So uh, when you show up for the uh, open house, depending on the volunteers we have, that's the number of attractions that we can open. I used to work at Great Adventure. We would never know what rides would open in the morning till the staff showed up and we'd all be dispatched around the park and they'd try to get the big events open. Um, I'm sorry to say, uh, Kundaka won't be operating at this open house. And that's that's a binocular. scary thought. That the music, the amusement telescope. parks don't know what's going to open until they they're no idea. Well, they that's have a priority. Scary. Yeah. Oh, you go priority. run the free fall thing, you know? <laughs> well, everyone was actually certified to run different parts of the park, okay. you know, different levels of certification. I would hope so. And then when you come in, they'd look at all of your safety tests and like, oh, Ted, you can run the coaster. So you go over and they, they literally would just throw you in every direction when you got into the park. You're probably working there some one time I was there. So, yeah, I could have been. I started on the Enterprise. Do you remember that thing that, that, thing that yeah. spun around? Yeah, we called it the, threw up on you. Yeah, we called it the flying puke buckets because, yeah. you know, That's it was funny. a great ride to work on because if the puke hit you, you got to go to um, costume change. You got Ugh. a half hour, got a half hour off. To I'd walk rather not go to costume change. <laughs> That's not the way I'd like to change costumes. Uh, you just get a little bit on your foot or something. Oh, I got to yeah. go change. <laughs> Oh, what a night, everybody. That was actually a very good talk. That was a great talk by uh, Robert. He's always really good. I'm going to, you know, we're going to leave that one up on YouTube. Should we do something about that telescope? Like, should we take initiative and contact that school and when I was maybe in, have them donate it to us or something? I'll bet you it's in such horrible shape. You wouldn't want to touch it. Really? Um, they have a planetarium. Central High School had a planetarium in the basement. And 20 years ago, when I joined Rittenhouse, um, I was asked if I would take it over. It was such a wreck. It was, it was a little tiny spitz and it was one of the portable spitz things. And it was stuck in a corner of a room and they had like an umbrella structure that just hung from the ceiling hmm. that you would sit under and look at it. So okay. Cent Central High School has had telescopes, they've had planetariums, but I think you know, unless you have the proper educator, unless you have the proper person who's motivated to get the equipment going, I, I give up from the outside working in. Um, one of the reasons we're not back at Centennial, and let me just take a look at who's here. One of the reasons we're not back at Centennial is because um, when I went in there four years ago and started bringing Rittenhouse in, I was there at the, let's say, the pleasure of that current superintendent. When that superintendent reaches disfavor, he is taken out on the rail and anything that he touched is, is abandoned also. So we invested a quarter of a million dollars in a planetarium that there's no interest in opening once again. <laughs> so, so I'm not even going to try to reach into the school system at this point. I, I just think it's a failed attempt. I don't think there's really, unless you can find a person from within who has a commitment, who's willing to do a little extra work past the end of the school day, something that is not, not, not easy to find towards the end of my career there, you're not going to make it happen. I, I was just wondering if they would maybe donate it to us or something that for us They could, purposes. they could, but I look at the I look at the five scopes sitting in the back of Muddy Run that aren't being used. I look at all that stuff and I think, you know, there's many things that we should be working on before we try to fix an old refractor. I'd love to get Dave Brown's uh one of the things now is we have that Quest Star, a, a seven inch Quest Star that's impeccable. And we're trying to get that operating. I'd rather see us put our effort into that. Then, yeah, you know, it would be better to get big modern telescopes going. Up, as yeah. much as I love a historic scope, but that's but a really, tiny like, what a five inch refractor. Yeah. And the secret is that's not going to wow the general public today. Right. And if there's nobody on that staff that's willing to do the time or the effort, you're not going to do it from the outside. I wasn't even thinking of restoring it. I was just thinking of having it and just, you know, just to display it. <laughs> Well, you've had it. You know, you know, in your backyard. What? What was that, Mike? Does Denise want an observatory in her backyard? I, no, not even for that reason. I just I feel I'm I'm a little bit of a hoarder, so it 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 bothers me that something is, I don't know, that, sure. that's just sitting there. 
Denise, we're trying to sell an entire observatory. And, you know, it's just. Yeah, you should have mentioned that too. Uh, I let everybody here know. I mean, they might want so, a shed for their yard. Should I tell them the truth or should I give them the sales pitch? No, you should tell them the truth because it's only. So, yeah, to stop recording go on, on YouTube. YouTube. Oh, okay. Hold on. That's your right. Bye, everybody. For, for those of us, yeah, for those of us in our business YouTube now. Audience, we're going to talk some 